we on? Sweet. Welcome to the show, Nigel. Thank you. Really appreciate having you here. It's been pretty good, cool. yeah. You're probably one of the... I'm real excited for this. I was looking forward to this oh, all don't month. Don't be too excited, because then it just... <laughs> it's like if you're really excited about, I don't know, the last season of Game of Thrones, and then it's a bit rubbish, you go... Mm. Have you watched it? It came out yesterday. Yeah. We signed up to Neon just for this month Jesus. to watch it. Yeah. It's good? It's it's pretty good. Are you a Game of Thrones fan? Yeah, I am. I was waiting for it, but I haven't watched it yet. No. Well, I, I won't spoil anything, but it's like, it's pretty amazing. Yeah. it's. I think that's probably one of the best shows I've ever watched. You know, the cinematography, the, the drama. It's just that, epic. Yeah. Everything. And apparently the, the big battle, the final battle, oh. is like the biggest ever in the history of film or television. Like, it's Jesus. huge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they do that stuff, yeah, really well, and yeah. and and it's just it's great stories and it's really good characters. It's not just all dragons and swords. Yeah. Like it's actually really interesting. Characters it is, yeah, really, you know. Yeah. Do you think that the little kid, the one who's uh, who can't walk, do you think he controls the the Night King? I I've I have many theories. Yeah, a lot of I people think, think that. I don't think he controls the Night King. You re- no. You reckon? No, I don't think he controls the Night King. I I I my theory is this would be my theory. I think yeah. well, I've got a couple of theories. Yeah. One, I think uh, old uh, little Arya Stark. I think she could kill the Night King. I think she could put on nah, a dead face and know. kill him. I don't know. Because she's got her Valyrian steel dagger. You see. That is true. That mm. is true. You sound like such a Game of Thrones nerd at this point. Oh, but it's no. so hard not to be because. It is, to be honest. Yeah. It's actually real interesting. I like the the way they they tell each story differently. Yeah. Like the Queen Arya story, uh, John Joe John Snow's story. You know, it's all very very different. And they come from a different angle. Yeah, and and what I like about it too is that you have really strong female characters. Like you don't have the normal stuff, which is the, it's always the blokes rescuing the woman all over the place. Like you have you the, the female characters in in Game of Thrones are, are like really strong. That is true. Like it, it tells are, you a lot about power as well. Yeah. Like power hungry people, what they would do for power, yeah. and you can actually like learn from them. Be like, you know, that applies to real life as well. Yeah, and you know, and uh, and uh, and the perils of organized religion and stuff like that too. You know, it's like yeah, the high septum and the sparrows. They, yeah, they, they went bad pretty quick. That is true. They they took power and they yeah. they, they ruined that queen. Yeah, it was interesting. So the first question I had was, why do you do what you do? Like, what's the reasoning? Because you've done this for quite a while and you've made you know, a, you know, you've done a lot with it. So what's the reasoning? What's the purpose behind this? Or you mean like the telly stuff? The television, the books. Um. Well, a lot a of normal it's... psychologist wouldn't, you know, normally do all this stuff. But why did you, you know? Oh, I just think I get bored really quickly. So like, I did the clinical stuff for a long time. Like I saw families and people for a long time. Um, but it's like you just want to keep learning stuff. And so, and there's only so many people you can talk to if you see people sitting in a room. So the book thing came along because I thought, well. You can talk to more people if you write a book. Um, and then uh, the tally stuff just came along and was super interesting and fun. And it was a whole bunch of new stuff to learn and a whole bunch of new jargon and skills. Um, and, you know, telling a story on TV is very different to telling a story in a book. And interviewing someone on TV is very different to interviewing someone when you're doing kind of clinical stuff. So, it was just yeah, it was a whole bunch of new skills to learn, really. Yeah, and how did you go about learning these new skills? What was the framework? Just get it wrong a lot. Like you just fuck up a lot. Can I say fuck in yeah, this podcast? Yeah, yeah. Fuck, um, you fuck, fuck up. Along. Yeah, 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 you fuck up a lot. Like so, basically, um, at the beginning, I had no idea what I was doing, and so you just ask a bunch of dumb questions, and um, you, uh, yeah, you just make a lot of mistakes, and you do a lot of things that are just kind of dumb i mean the nice thing about tv though is that it's not just you right so you're working mm. with a team of really skilled people who who they just get rid of the dumb stuff and they yeah. leave the kind of good stuff in so if you've got you know if you've got a good dop and a good director and a good soundy all of those people you know and the crew part of it um help when you're actually capturing the content and then you get back and you've got editors who craft that into the story and you know obviously directors are still involved there and you've got producers so you still have a bunch of people who are looking at this thing that you're making it's not just mm. um, it's not, the hardest bit is when there's something you really love and you've got to cut it that's true that's quite hard especially mm. if it's like oh, I mean we spent 12 hours that day making that and it was a really really terrible long hot unpleasant day and now you're going to cut it great right but you got to still like just truck along. Yeah, because ultimately it's like um, it's you're not making it for yourself. You're making it for other people. So we we kind of had a process in our office that um, 
we would sit down and shout to everyone, like everyone who works in the company would look at it, and if anyone didn't like anything, we would, and, and they could make a case of why it was done, then you kind of, you get rid of it. Because, you know, it's like, that's how you make the best stuff. You, It's collaborative. Like, everything is collaborative. Everything. Yeah. What I really like about your TV shows is you learn a lot from it. You know, you learn a lot. It's like real life topics, and you're constantly learning something new about you know yourself about society in general what made you go down this route though so we have a kind of a pro we talk about um when we make stuff we have this idea we call, kind of call a secret engine so if you make tv there should be some intellectual some some, some something intellectually rigorous underneath it some research uh, and you know some stuff we actually know not just our mad ideas mm -hmm. and then what you want to do is wrap around that it has to be entertaining uh, and it has to be interesting and you have to learn stuff that's kind of some stuff is just sort of interesting and some things that are actually kind of you know help you to live your life better whether that be managing money better or um you know just brain stuff that makes it easy to understand why we do some of the weird things that we do so yeah we've always had a big uh, tr trying to balance those things it has to be entertaining and it has to look good um and you have to learn there has to be some kind of take-home things like if someone's going to invest an hour of their life or half an hour in their life and watching something you want to get something out of it. Like yeah. the, and there's nothing wrong with, you know, the the telly, which is just pure candy floss TV. You know, yeah. that stuff is fine. Some people need escapism. Just yeah, man. It's like, I'm totally fine with that. Yeah. Um, it's just that we, that's not what, mm. I don't want to, you know, you will never see me on Dancing with the Stars or stuff like that because uh, <laughs> I can't dance. Uh, <laughs> and uh, it's just not my thing. Yeah. Now, that's really interesting. Like, you know, I was uh, researching for this interview. I was watching a lot of it and, I realize a lot about you know human nature you know what makes us human beings the connections the social you know the social connection we we sort of fiend for and that's another big topic it's like what makes us human beings what you know because you, you've done a lot in this yeah yeah what's your perspective on what's the most important thing for us as human beings or what's in our DNA it's programmed us it's so we have these amazing brains right that mm. and it's compared to all the other creatures ours is pretty good um and it's astoundingly complex and it can do some amazingly complicated things like right now we're talking in this part of the world but yeah. people out there will be watching it sitting at home on yeah. phones or laptops or mm. wherever uh and we've made that possible so that the sound which currently is these things going into that yeah uh, like chimpanzees can't do that yeah. like they just throw poo at each other and squirrels just go and gather nuts and there are other social creatures but our brains are astounding and we still don't really understand it's like with brains the more you understand the more there is that we don't understand so every time they're kind of oh that's how that bit kind of works then underneath that there's another whole layer but but how does the bit underneath that bit work um so our brains are undoubtedly the thing that make us um these astoundingly complex beings that we are uh, and that's I guess that's the interesting bit. It's like we, we're learning more and more about what makes us us. Like we know that we are social creatures, that our brains literally need connections with other brains. So if you're lonely, that has the same health impact as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Yeah, like I that's didn't a hear big, that. That's, a, that's like, you know, yeah. not many people realise that. No. And, and, we, and it's a bloody epidemic now yeah, as well. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Because you think about the fact there are lots of people that struggle with things like social mm. anxiety. Um, it's because people want that connection with other people. But sometimes your brain just fucks you up and makes it really hard to get that. Yeah, that's interesting because a couple of months ago, I was at a science camp for two weeks where you're just surrounded by people every day, probably 24 hours a day. You're like with people besides when you're sleeping or anything. But when I left the camp, it was like sort of a, a longing, like sort of something missing. And it was that connection I felt. Yep. And I was like, shit, this is so powerful. It felt like I was sort of hurt in a way. But, it, you know? Yeah, and I think different people are different. So like introverts, mm. like for an introvert, that sounds like a freaking nightmare. Yeah. Uh, extroverts love that kind of stuff. So there are like some people that feed off, like they get more energy from being around other people. Yeah. Uh, and then there are introverts who can do that, but find that stuff draining. So I would, like in my actual life, I'm more, my, way more an introvert than an extrovert. Like you I'm reckon? Not, heck yeah. Like I'm yeah. not an extrovert at all. My idea of a fucking nightmare is <laughs> part, I hate parties. Parties are <laughs> awful. They're just awful. Because... You're in a room full of people. If like if you know the people, it's yeah. fine. But if it's a room full of people that you don't know, you're like, oh, mm. how are you? 
Yeah. Right. But do you think that's set in stone, the whole introvert, extrovert? Do you think that's people just try putting themselves in a square box where that's what you are? Or could you merge in and out? You can, you can learn skills, but fundamentally, you, you know, the, the, so things like the Dunedin study, which is a great big longitudinal study, which has been following people from birth to, well, I think at the moment they're age 45, 46 Jeez. or something. Um, and something like 97% of the people who began at the experiment who were still alive are still taking part of it. So it's a... It's a major bit of science. What we know is that temperament and personality, they do kind of, you're kind of born with a certain temperament and personality, kind of a way of approaching life, but you can adjust and change that. An introvert will never be an extrovert. Like an introvert will never think, oh, I can't wait to go to that party of people that I don't know. That just sounds amazing. Um, <laughs> just like extroverts don't get at the whole introvert thing because they just want to be around people all the time. Um, but you can you can learn skills so if you have so if you're um, more reserved and you find socially awkward you can learn skills to get better at that stuff you know it's not like mm. you're you, if you're lonely now you're that's it forever you must always be that way it's yeah. you can learn and develop skills you can get better at small talk and you can find ways to make small talk more interesting and yeah not, you know do but, that. but how much of our behavior and personality is determined by our genes and how much of it do we actually choose how to you know go about things so there's a thing called epigenetics yeah. uh, which is nature it's it's sort of it's not nature or nurture it's um it, it, it's basically what happens is you you're born with a set of genes but your environment impacts on how those genes get exp expressed so you can have a set of genes and if you, you live in one environment they get triggered one way and if you live in another environment they get triggered another way um but fundamentally, and you know, which is scientifically, this stuff is all very interesting. But for actual humans, the the important stuff is that you're not um, you're not born hardwired, and you don't change. Brains are constantly changing and mm. learning all the time. So even people who have um, real problems with anxiety and depression, like that stuff, it's not hardwired, and and in, in the sense that you will always be that way. Like there are skills that you can learn that can help you to deal with that stuff. So you're not stuck in a box. Um, yeah. But we do kind of come out. A certain way you know like your your fundamental who you are as a person doesn't really the core of it doesn't change but the skills that you can wrap around that to interact with the world that stuff can all change yeah but that's real interesting that the hard thing I have grappling with that is that you know it, it sort of contradicts the whole you know aspect of set mindset and growth mindset in the terms no, of same. changing you know? No, it's all good. It's it fits in completely with that because yeah. what that what that um, fixed and growth mindset stuff is saying is that your attitude to learning has an impact on how much you can learn. Yeah. So, so you know, some people, if you if you got that fixed mindset, you think Tiger Woods was born Tiger Woods. Mm. If you have a growth mindset, and it's actually the kind of the more accurate one, yeah. then what you go is, well, no, Tiger Woods wasn't born Tiger Woods. He was born just some little kid. He just played a heck of a lot of golf and he got really good at it. And yeah. so, you can improve skills like one of the amazing things about our brains is they're plastic and they can change mm. and so your personality may be a certain way but over time your personality can change so you might be super shy with other people but that's you're not it's you won't always be that way like there are things that you can do that can help you to do yeah. that that's just your brain that's trying to push mm. you down a particular path that's that's real interesting as well but i think sometimes being in school some people just say you know I'm this way and I won't change and you know, it's very limiting and sometimes I'm like you know you're not really that way per se you can actually get better but it's because you've conditioned your mind to think a certain way you sort of live that out to be true yeah and I think it's not just people in school I think lots of people think that they just go well this is just how I am and yeah. it's like well Yes, it's, it's how you are now, but what we know is that the more you practice a skill, the better you get it. There is no magic bang and now I'm different. Mm. It's like if you decide that you want to change something about yourself, you can do that. It just takes, um, you have to be deliberate in how you do it. And so it's like, you know, you can't just decide to play the ukulele. You can, you can decide that you want to play the ukulele, but you don't automatically you can't just play it you've got to practice it so you've yeah. got to get lessons and learn some technique and practice chord changes and then you can practice yeah. and the more you practice the better you'll get and the difference between someone who can't play a ukulele and someone who is a virtuoso ukulele player mm. is just practice and it's real fulfilling when you do the hard things and you get an outcome like a reward from it 
Yeah. You know, when yeah. you're, you're yeah. grinding away at a discipline, let's say learning how to play the guitar, you're grinding away every day, every day. And then after a month, you can play a song, you know, or it, it feels yeah. real, really yeah. good. Yeah. Why is that though? Um, because when we learn stuff, our brain gets a little, like when we achieve something, our brains go, oh, let's give, here's a little dose of happy chemicals. And mm -hmm. it makes us want to learn stuff. Like learning stuff does feel good. It does. It gives us this little sense of triumph. Because yeah. a long time ago, our brains decided that actually learning things was a good idea. Yeah. And so because your brain is a whole bunch of different bits, it's not just one sort of unified thing that's got some master plan. There's a whole bunch of bits and they've all got their own agendas. It's trying to kind of, get everybody move it's a bit like you know the parliamentary system it's like MMP it's trying to get everyone to kind of go a particular way so what it does it rewards you when um, you do things that uh, generally are good for you sometimes it rewards you when you do things that aren't good for you like you know drugs and alcohol those sorts of things yeah. like it gives you chemicals then too yeah but um, yeah learning is, is good for you so your brain goes ka-ching happy yeah. feelings and that's I think that's one of the greatest things about a human being is that you can start with a, being a nose at anything and if you sort of grind away at it and learn it you can get maybe not the world's best but you can be really good yeah you know and that's powerful you know my thing is anyone can do um like I anyone can do um uh, you know quantum mechanics right super mm. complicated physics people go oh that's not something that normal humans can do yeah it is all you got to do is you just got to read lots and learn and think about it like anyone mm. can do that quantum physics stuff yeah you just have to, just like anyone can play tennis um mm. without doubt there are some people like it's easier for some people in the sense that um you know you're if you're not interested in something you're never going to be super great at it you know like mm. i don't really like parties so i'm never going to be great at parties because i've got no interest <laughs> in being great at parties i'd rather be great at what's on netflix yeah. you know um mm. so the stuff that you know the stuff that sort of you're naturally drawn to you're just going to be m much better at and that's why i think sometimes it's 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 some people kind of struggle against that and they think oh, i should be this or i should be that it's like well i just you know just kind of figure out a way to be you in a way that works for you but then even that's hard figuring Hell out no. yourself well no one knows that you know no one no well, one knows it's, that it's a lifetime of yeah, figuring yeah. shit out and it's just, actually yeah. i actually think it's more about just getting more and more at peace with the fact that you're a little bit fucked up and there's <laughs> some stuff <laughs> <laughs> Because like when you're right. kind of, I think when you're starting out, yeah. you kind of think, okay, I've got to work out my life and my career and how to be content and happy and yeah. in relationships and all that stuff. It's like, yeah, but you, you kind of, if you get some of that stuff worked out by the end, yeah. Yeah, pretty good. Mostly it's just about making peace with your own imperfections and inadequacies, you know? But why is there an immense pressure, especially in high school, to figure out what you want to do for the rest of your life? Oh, I think a lot of that is... Um, it's so much pressure. It's yeah. Like they, they expect choose, you to know. Choose, yeah, choose, you gotta choose. Choose, you got to you know, stick to this path. University trades, university trades. Make it quick, exactly. quick. Time's yeah. ticking. Yeah. You, you've only got 70 years left of your life to, you know. And some people get so stressed out of that. Yeah. They're like, fuck, if I don't choose now, I would never amount to anything, all that shit. And you're like, man, but we still got ages yeah and the stakes are much higher for you guys too because like when i was at that point um university was free and so i don't you know like now you've got to pay fees for everything and you get committed and all that okay like after a fucking degree yeah exactly and and oftentimes i also think some of the thinking around our degree is really worth it i think it's good to be thinking about that too because like last year there were 200 companies that released an open meter our production company was one of them but it was people like trade me and big banks and zero yeah. and a whole bunch of people so you don't have to have degrees to have careers in our organisations because they kind of get tired of all these young people. That's really interesting. That That's go off very, and, very like interesting. Yeah, people, Why was that though? Why oh, because they, they get sick of the fact that, that well, not sick of the fact, but like they don't like the fact that young people go off to universities to get degrees and come out with lots of debt and they don't any have any particularly useful skills from university per se. Mm. So like I think universities are still good places to, if you're super interested in a thing, say, I don't know, um, the arts or politics or um, science or whatever. Like, if you're super, go off and do a degree. Like, that's what university should be for. But don't go and do a, like, a, I don't know, a communications degree or a whatever degree just because you think it's going to get you a better position in an organisation. Like, find out some stuff first yeah. because they don't all require you to have degrees now. Well, I think a lot of it stems from parental pressures, though. Like, a lot of parents are pressuring 
I have their kids to go to university because they want to say that my son graduated from Auck University, AUT University. I think I think part of it. Well, I think it's part of that. I also think what it is is that for parents, like the so the world that we came from was a very different world. Like you go and you get a degree and you get a good job and you have a career for life. Mm. But now a lot that's of that's still there. Yeah. yeah, and it's that's all changing. So, you mm. know, it used to be that, you know, when I left school, people could get a, say, become an accountant or lawyer, expect to get a job and expect to be an accountant or lawyer forever. But um, with the technology stuff that's coming and the AI stuff that's coming, things like accountancy and law are not careers that I would necessarily be steering towards yeah. because, you know, you've got IBM's... Um, AI thing, Ross, which is, uh, it's kind of, you know, the, the, the equivalent of, you know, the, the IBM equivalent of Siri for lawyers. Um, and it can do something like 120,000 hours of lawyer research in seconds. And so, and a lot of that research would have been taken by new graduates. And so now you can just, you know, type into Ross, find me some precedents mm-hmm. around, and it goes. And with Moore's them. law, the cost of that being produced for, you know, people to buy like companies would reduced to a person yeah. on yeah. a salary yeah. yeah so i think i think parents want their kids to do degrees because they think that will be the best for them and i think it's taking everyone mm. a little bit of time to get their heads around the future so you know like for a long time we've had this whole university's trades thing it's like if you're smart you go to university if you're good with your hands you go up and do trades and it's like mm. what the hell does that even mean yeah. like i don't even know what that means um the reality is, like, there are lots and lots of jobs and trades. Like, I think the construction industry, there's something like $50 billion worth of construction that we can't do because we don't have enough skilled and qualified people to do it. Mm. So, you know, and if you're interested in, say, building a company, well, one way would be to go off and do a management degree. Another, another way to do that would be go off and do a, do a building apprenticeship and then do a couple of years as a builder and then start employing people and run your own company. And you can rapidly expand mm. to a pretty large company um, if you're smart and you could do that stuff. So, well, the amount of books out there, like especially if you want to start a company, let's say a software company, or, you know, if you have a good idea... Just, you know, get in touch with a few people, freelance, work to build it, all that stuff. It's out there. You don't yeah. need to be 22, 23 to do that shit. No. I mean, yeah. everything is on YouTube. Like, if you want to find out anything, oh, yeah. like, all human knowledge is there. So, mm. you can learn to code, you can learn to do this, you can learn to that, you can learn to do anything. Um, yeah. Uh, you, it's, so, you don't necessarily need that um, formal university. And I'm not saying you shouldn't go to university either, because for some people, I think it's a really good thing to do. You know, if you're really passionately interested in a the subject, then go and do it. And if you want to go and do medicine and accountancy or law, then I think that's fine. Go off and do those things. Yeah. But also, I think just go into it with your eyes open about what the future, you know, people would have thought medicine is safe, but every time they've put. Um, you know, AI up against um, humans, AI is better at diagnoses and uh, a bunch of other stuff. So yeah. we're not going to have robot doctors They say soon. general practitioners, especially, they might be out of a job in the next 20, 30 years. Yeah, possibly. Um, yeah. I, I think specialists like radiographers. Um, oh, they're gone. And radi- they, they're, they're gone. I think, I, I think it's going to... <laughs> It's like anything. I was Bill Gates said that we overestimate the change in the next two or three years, but we underestimate the change in the next ten years. I think yeah. that's kind of pretty much the case. You know, I mm. think that um, the future is a l- is uncertain, um, but you can still have. It's not like you know humans are going to get eaten by robots or we're all going to disappear. There are still going to be careers and jobs and all that kind of stuff. You just have to, I think, just have open eyes going be into this Instagram stuff. influencer, and you can. <laughs> 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 yeah, might could be a thing. Um, you, yeah, I, and I, I, I think if you don't have it worked out by the time you leave mm. high school, it's not a big deal. Like yeah. a lot of people don't. I, I hadn't. It took me years to work stuff out. Yeah, but it's interesting. Like the university degree, I think that like the whole idea of scarcity. I think back when you were studying, a university degree was probably scarce in terms of. Maybe going to a company, but now because you can, everyone nearly goes to university. Everyone's going. There's so much yeah. supply out there, yeah. and the whole idea of scarcity brings down the value of it. Yeah, yeah particularly when a lot of companies um, don't necessarily want them at all. Um, mm. So that's something to think about. Like, do you need to go and spend thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars to get a degree? that may not necessarily get you any further ahead. But what's the alternative, though? 
Um, if you're not going there, like how else could you? Let's you, say you want to work for zero. How would I you think trade may have like a no degrees required part of their job stuff, so you can go in there and you can apply for jobs. So zero will take people without degrees. You go in, you apply for a job. They look at you. Uh, essentially, what people want is they want people who are smart, who are able to collaborate, who can problem solve, and who are low maintenance. And if you can communicate and do all those things, then you will be the kind of person that people want. The, the sort of employees that are hard to find are people who you can just give them a problem and they'll go and fucking sort it out. And if they don't, can't mm. sort it out, they'll come back to you and go, mm. Yeah. they're good at working with other people, they're proactive. They're, you know, like those communication, collaboration, being cooperation. Resourceful. That's all that kind mm. of stuff is super, super, super. Those are the employable people. Yeah. One of the things I really like about school, one, one teacher in particular, they gave us a project. They said, go figure it out. Do it yourself. And it was yeah. very hard because yeah. you had no guidance in a way. Yeah. But you sort of had to learn the skill of not knowing, but going out and finding it. Yeah, and if you're that person where pe- uh, people can give you something, to, can you go and sort this out? And you're sure. Yeah. And then you go and do it. Uh, you, you know, like you quickly become invaluable. So we, you know, in our industry, we'd have people who are production assistants who tend to be young people who are just starting out. Um, and the production assistants who stand out are the ones who are proactive and can problem solve and just do stuff like they just they take we had a we were filming in a studio once we didn't have enough people and um izzy who got the gold star um she just went up she because we were worrying about people not turning up to these experiments um she just off her own back just went up and down the street and like found two people to in the street that we were <laughs> filming and to come and do stuff and so it's that kind of stuff and yeah. what that does is it it makes her so many think god she goes from being um you know just another production assistant to what can we do to keep her, her? you know yeah. what i mean like you want to be the person where people are going how do we keep her how do we keep mm. him because they're really good but how do you get in that frame of mindset to always over deliver for your employers you know sometimes give more value than you they ask of you and it sort of makes you invaluable I- well, see, I don't think you have to be, you don't have to be crazy and work stupid hours because I think sometimes employers will exploit people as well. Um, you know, that's that, 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 did you see that muffin break woman who said, nobody wants to come and work for me for free anymore? Like lazy young yeah, people? Yeah, I heard, yes. And I then like the it. whole world went, yeah. shut up. Yeah. And she went, you know, when I said no one wants to come and work for free, I didn't mean people should come and work for me for free. Yeah, no, that's totally what you meant because it's exactly what you said. Um, <laughs> So there are people like that out there who I think will just ruthlessly exploit people. But I think what you have to do, what I would say to people is get a job and just be just be good at your job. Like you don't have to work 400 hours a week because that's not good for you either. And, and you don't want to let yourself be exploited so that you're working crazy hours and not getting that stuff recognized. Just just be really good at what you do. And if you can't do something, ask about it. Um, and kind of just be resourceful and take initiative so that if, you, if you're standing there and you see something he's doing, just do it. Do you know whether it's service industry mm. stuff or, or film TV stuff or um, stuff in an office or whatever? It's like just if you see stuff. I mean, that's still stuff that I do too, right? It's like you – I just think, well, I'm not doing anything. How can I be useful? So if we're out filming stuff, it's like, well, what can I carry? What can I come and get? What can I do? Blah, blah, blah. Because it's like, well, don't stand like a fucking gonk. Like, <laughs> do something. Be useful. Yeah, that's interesting. But – do you do you think that let's say in the next twenty thirty years would have universal basic income? I don't know. It's complicated. So there's lots of experiments running at the moment, um, and uh, there's some pretty good arguments. What I, I saw some results a little while ago. It seems like in one case employment didn't necessarily um, increase, but people's happiness and health and those sorts of things did. And so I think the long-term benefits of the UBI would be that it takes pressure and stress off people and it just makes life a little bit easier. Whatever the case, if you look at what's happening in the world at the moment, we have a very unequal distribution of wealth at the moment. And so mm. capitalism is okay. Um, you, I mean, you talk to some economists, they'll say capitalism is great and it's lifted people out of poverty all over the world mm. and they can share the scripts. And that's true. Technically, capitalism has lifted millions and millions and millions of people out of abject poverty but it's lifted them so if this is abject poverty it's lifted them eh, up to about here like just above that so most of the world is still living a pretty shitty life Mm. so capitalism it's true has lifted people's lives a little bit i think there are some big questions around has it lifted them enough has it lifted them in a way that's fair and reflects the amount that people have put on and you know even when we have people in this country who are who are working and still can't afford to feed their children. Like, that's 
fucked up. Like, how is it yeah. possible that you could be working 70 hours a week and still getting food bags, food parcels? Like, how is that a thing? That's very, Yeah, that, that's another big issue in New Zealand. That whole uh, debate as well now, minimum wage. A lot of the employers I've talked to about it, they say that it will increase the cost of labour, which would mean they sometimes might have to cut labour. So less jobs. That's the economic theory. When you increase minimum wage, the amount of jobs reduces because less employers are able to employ people. I think that's what a lot of people say. Yeah. Um, but uh, I think there's a counter narrative too, which is actually the data doesn't always bear that out. And and there are plenty of people who pay the minimum wage when they could be paying people more. You know, we spoke to uh, we interviewed a woman who was working at a. Um, a fast food company, I won't say which one, uh, and she was being paid the minimum wage and couldn't afford to feed her kids or take them to the doctor and stuff. Well, like, how is that possible when you work for a great big multinational fast food chain mm. that you can't afford to feed your kids? Like, that's that's kind of wrong. That's people not distributing the income from their business in a way that's that's kind of fair. Mm. Well, the, the capitalist... This is why young people should vote... <laughs> because if you don't, basically what you're doing yeah. is, it's like, it's like, I was a quote from someone, I can't remember who it was. Someone said, basically, would you let your granddad, would you let your granddad make decisions about your life and career? Like, would you say to granddad, oh, look, you can make all the decisions about what I'm doing socially and my education and the music doesn't mm. do anything. You can decide that, granddad. No, you wouldn't. Well, I think the, the big reason why, you know, most people don't, young people don't vote or, you know, even the, the prejudice I have about it is that, I don't really think my vote counts. Like it's just one person. You know what I mean? It's like one person in a in a sea of people. Like how does you know? For me, it's like I, I would have met it anyway. Like my vote, yeah. Which is a very like, and that's at one level that's true, right? The, yeah. the economics say your vote really, your vote individually doesn't count. But there is that thing about a sea change. Um, and if young people got out and voted, then it would change the government, and it 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 just kind of would. So. Uh, and, and in reality, it's like the people who are the most affected by elections are young people. Like, I'm not. I'll be dead soon. You'll be around for ages. And so I can fuck up the planet and go, ah, oh, sorry. Yeah, we, we there's plastics and there's a bunch of yeah. walruses in Alaska jumping off cliffs and stuff. And it's, mm. it's all a bit grim, but I'm out. So I'm, I'm gone. So good luck with that. I'm just going to... Uh, just mm. gonna die now. Yeah, you should. De- I mean, I t- and I, when I was young, it was the same thing. You kind of think, Ooh. Yeah. Um, well, I you think vote. I think the the big thing as well about it is that a lot of people don't trust po- politicians in a way. They they think that they all lie, that they're all you know criminal way, that they're not telling the truth, that they're getting some, they're trying to get something out of you, that they're not telling everyone. I think it's been influenced by Hollywood a lot, but. That's another factor as well, because my prejudice is, you know, being influenced all my life is that I don't really trust politicians, not for any valid reason, but it's just that internal bias that, you know, they're trying to do some dumbass shit. But at one level, politicians are pretty simple creatures. They go where the votes are, right? Yeah. And so they will, you know, what, what inevitably happens is they make all sorts of promises around elections and then they actually get into government and then they actually find out what's happening and they actually have to try and follow through on those promises. But what I would say, how are those student loans working out for you guys? Like, how's that working out? Yeah. And it's like, mm. if you don't like that, then just freaking vote. Do you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. lo- how's, the whole, how's the whole climate change thing working out for you guys? Like, yeah. if you're cool about it, if you think we're doing a great job, that's fine. Yeah. Don't vote, just leave it up to us. Uh, we're cool. Um, but if you kind of think, oh, no, you're killing the world, then and you're not doing anything about it, eh, then maybe you should vote. Yeah. A lot of teachers lost their, a lot of principals lost their shit over that uh, climate change protest yeah it's funny it's it's weird i was like so it's like what we do is we say bloody young people bloody selfish bloody young people on their bloody devices don't take any bloody interest in politics won't bloody get out and vote won't do anything bloody they're just all bloody self-interest and then they go out and they want to take time out to protest and they go bloody young people bloody taking an interest in politics and getting out there and getting involved (laughs) in changing the world bloody that's not right you should be in school bloody just doing stuff i just think it, uh, it seems a little dumb that um that that people were being sent to detention because they went to protest climate change. Yeah, that was fucking interesting. And, and all these people saying, yeah. oh, why don't they just do it at the weekend? Because no one would pay attention. If it's just a weekend, it's a bunch of kids getting together at the weekend. Mm. 
if they walk out of school, suddenly everybody goes, hang on. That's the point of a protest. The point of a protest is to... Disrupt. Is to get people's attention, is to yeah. disrupt stuff. So if yeah. you're not employed and you can't leave work, what you can do is you can walk out of the thing that drives the, you know, your parents crazy, which is you being in school. And yeah. maybe, um, and what it did is it, it, it got a whole bunch of people talking mm. about climate change. Protest, I think, is very underrated. As you know, it used to be big, it used to be some shit happens, everyone gets out, they're trying to send a message. But now, I don't know, maybe it's just my perspective. Not many people see it, see the value in protesting. Yeah, but, but and you've only got to look at reasons like in the Arab world, like the, in the Arab Spring, like it changed governments, like it changed whole countries because people got out and protested and they said enough's enough. And so stuff can, protests can still change things. And, and, you know, even if you think, well, companies run the world now, governments don't, well, that's true, but companies care about customers and they are getting, mm. corporates are more and more concerned about these, you know, conscious consumers. This idea that people can go, I'm not going to those guys, they're assholes. Yeah. I'm not buying new stuff anymore. It's shifted, eh? Mm. It's shifted majorly mm. in the last 20 years between companies exploiting our natural resources and now they're shifting their perspective. They're yeah. like green, they're, they're trying to be more sustainable and now it's more economically profitable to, to do yeah. that. And I think the thing, I think now that I didn't, like I think when I was young I had a lot of cynicism about, and, and there are lots of companies that are bad, right? But mm. but the, the truth is a lot of these companies are actually just made up by humans who have families and kids and live in the world and so they want to do decent things. Like there are lots of companies in New Zealand that do really, really good things. You know, so AJ Hackett, right? They're a company that employs mostly young people um, and they're mostly young people from all over the world. They do all kinds of great stuff for their staff. So um, their, their, their people in Queenstown get paid more than in other companies because they want people to be less stressed. They have a like an orphan's Christmas dinner because they know how some of these kids have come from all over the world so they do that mm. kind of stuff. They work four days a week instead of um, five days a week so that they can have time off because, again, they realise that life can be stressful. Also, people have come to Queenstown when you're young to have fun and do adventures. They want to give them time to do that. Um, and these are the people that interact with your customers. So if they're relaxed and happy and well paid, yeah. then everybody wins. So I think there are lots of companies who are trying to do um, the right thing. There are, there are lots that aren't. Yeah. But I think there are lots that are. And, and the ones that aren't will just get dragged along by the ones that are, particularly if customers go, well, you guys are being assholes. We're not going to buy yeah. your stuff. But do you think, you know, most of, you know, what AJ Hackett's doing, the company, do you think a lot of that is could work in other companies? Is that idealistic? Yeah, treating too, people... Too idealistic? Or no, it's is like... Is it re re realistic in the sense that a lot of people can adopt the same methods? Yeah, it's a really fundamental, basic thing. Just treat people decently. Like, mm. pay people well. Like, if you pay people decently and you treat them decently and you're good to them, then they will be happy uh, and they will be healthier and they won't take sick days and they'll care more about their job and yeah. everybody wins. You know, it's like, it's just a really basic, mm. basic principle. If you treat people decently, everybody wins. Doing good is good business. It's good for business. Yeah. And, the, it, and it means you can sleep at night because you think, actually, I, the people who work for me, their I lives are better. Them, yeah. Yeah. That's a major uh, argument that Simon Sinek in his book Leaders Eat Last makes that you know if you extend the circle of safety in your work environment, people you know want to work for you. They don't have to work for you. Yeah. And when you shift that, people go the extra mile to serve their customer, which in turn gets you more profit. Yeah. All this stuff. Well, it's like no one ever got out of bed thinking I can't go and wait to give my all to this company that doesn't give a shit about me. Yeah. No one, no one ever thought that. But mm. if you work for some, if you work for a boss that you like and a company that you like where you feel like it's people who do give a shit about, then then you do kind of work harder because mm. you want it, their success is your success. You know, it's like yeah. it's a together thing. Like if the company succeeds, then I keep getting paid and I keep getting to work here. If they fail, then I have to go and work for some other assholes, and I actually quite like it here. So I'm going to work hard to try and help them to win. And that's cool. I think. I think we shift. I think the new generation really sees that. Yeah. Real simple philosophy: treat people nicely, yeah. treat people well, yeah, and they will in return do the same for you. Yeah. And don't do it just. Don't do it out of like. Don't do it to increase profits. Do it because it's the right thing to do. Yeah. Like, do it for authentic reasons because because you these these are humans that and and they are part of this your company so. Do it because it's just a good thing to help those people. And if you do that, then, yeah, like, it, it, things yeah. improve. One of the things I wanted to ask you, based on the whole climate change issue, 
I had a, I had a debate recent, not recent, a couple of months ago with someone who didn't believe in climate change. He was really convinced in the whole. Yeah. He says Al Gore's conspiracy theory yeah. that he does. He has a private jet. He he's doing all this shit while preaching differently. And a lot of some people believe in that. And not a lot of people. I think majority of people really believe in climate change and that's happening. What's your take on that? It's like all of those arguments, right? You could draw a Venn diagram of stupid. And the people who <laughs> the people who don't believe in climate change tend to be the people who don't believe in uh, vaccinating and they don't believe in things like fluoride. And so my thing is always this. Who are you going to go to for advice and to, for information to try and understand the world? scientists and doctors or people that post shit on Twitter. Do you know what I mean? It's like, yes. that's your choice. Because it Eight is years. kind of like, oh, yep, so the science over there, you know, there's all that science over there. Or there's some dude that posts stuff on Twitter and Facebook. It's, it's literally that simple. And, you know, this idea that it's some big conspiracy of scientists and they're all blah, blah, blah. No, it's not. They're just, they're not, I've been, like we made a doco down in the Antarctic. I've been around scientists a lot. They're not really into conspiracies. Do you know yeah. what I mean? It's like it's just not their thing. They're interested in finding out is the ice melting at a faster rate? What's happening to the algae underneath the sea ice in the Ross yeah. Sea? What's happening to penguin numbers? Like they're not thinking, oh, mm. hang on, I found this thing about penguin, the penguin population, but I'm going to suppress that because yeah. it doesn't fit the narrative. Well, I think some people just want to disagree for the sake of disagreeing. Oh, yeah, yeah. That, you know, they just want to be different. They want to yeah. be unique. They want to have a different perspective. Which is fine. And people follow that. People who believe they're like, you know, fuck it. Like, the problem is the media, though. It's like what we shouldn't do is this false equivalency thing of, of what's happening a lot. A science, like a climate scientist up against someone who doesn't believe. Like that's, because that's not how it is. You should have, the, the people who don't believe in climate science should get the amount of time that, you know, that the people who share that view should have, which is like tiny, versus like 90 something percent of the world's climate scientists based on actual data going back for hundreds of thousands of mm. years. Um, and my thing about it is that even if you don't believe in climate change and even if you think the whole thing is a hoax, just shut up and get on board because there's money to be made in clean tech. Like as a country yeah. for us, mm. clean tech and clean technology and all that kind of stuff that's where there's gone. this money. So even if you don't believe yeah. it, even if you think it's a conspiracy, just shut up and, and play yeah. along. Well, the major argument I, I had with him, he, he was saying that the earth is naturally co uh, getting hotter. Or, you know, so, it's which naturally, <laughs> it's in its phase because of yeah. the ice age and the yeah. period, all that stuff. Yeah. And I've, this, this is true, that the Earth yeah. does heat and cool, and it has, there are cycles yeah. of heating and cooling, and we have had ice ages and things like that in the past. The problem is, and if you go back, I don't know, 10, 20,000 years, you can see these, and, and you think, but the graph looks the same now and then, now and then. <laughs> um, but if you go back hundreds of thousands of years, which we can do through ice cores and stuff like that, what you can see is that the, the CO2 levels over that time have massively spiked now and it is having an impact now. So we logically, we do know that CO2 is a, uh, it helps to, helps to, helps to yep. trap stuff. Um, and so if we're doing things which are massively increasing the amount of atmospheric CO2, if we are if we're knocking up against the, uh, the 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 even if you just think okay yes the earth does naturally warm and cool but we are doing things to exacerbate it now the big danger that people don't get is that it's not just about the temperature of the sky and that you'll be a little bit warmer it's that the, the global temperature drives things like sea ice production and, and the less sea ice you have the less heat gets reflected into yeah. the ocean and it doesn't have more hayline circulation yeah all that yep. kind of stuff right mm. you fuck up deep ocean circulation yep. we're in trouble because then 100%. you've got ice ages in the northern hemisphere and all that kind of stuff but yeah. that's complicated stuff um yeah. and a lot of people just go oh, it feels a bit warmer <laughs> so it feels nice yeah what's well, right. bad for us i think you know the amount of storm the 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 intensity of storms the intensity of heat waves all the stuff is increasing and i think it's in our best interest our best interest to do what we can yeah, would think. to sort of reduce it. Yeah, you would think. Mm, that's interesting. Yeah, or you could, you know, that's a vote or just leave it up to us. Yeah. Because we're doing such a great job. But why is it that people believe in conspiracy theories? Because uh, people... I've, I've been... F it, it's people really have a good story. It's like, I know people, I know people that think we didn't land on the moon. Um, I used to believe that. Yeah. But then I watched some, you know, read some books and I was like, oh no, this is Oh this yeah, bullshit. we really did. Um... <laughs> 
it's like people there's just, no wind on the moon people i think people like a good story and they like to think they're somehow seeing something different to what everyone else is seeing and so conspiracy theories are always, yeah yeah and the internet's great because people who are just a little bit gullible can you know you can the flat earthers put all mm. these i work with someone who thought the oh. earth could have been flat ah. um <laughs> i know <laughs> Because people put these videos out and they go, oh, we shined a light over a, yeah. a laser over a lake for 32 mm. kilometers. And if the earth was round, it shouldn't have, we shouldn't yeah. have seen it. But we did, therefore the earth isn't round. And so people go, oh, well, the earth yeah. must be flat because the laser thing's like, dude, that's yeah. not how that works. Yeah. There's an interesting study done by, I think, a psychologist. And what they did was they had people that believe in conspiracy theories. They showed them a few... Inform- they gave them a few information about theories that they thought were conspiracy theories and people sort of said yep i believe in this but then they showed them the percentage of people that also believed in this what they found is that when people believe in a believed in that sort of theory a high percentage of people believe in a theory they sort of changed their perspective they don't want to believe in that anymore but yeah. if it was a small percentage they wanted to and believe they believed it. what they said was that people want to be unique want to have a different perspective and that's why they sort of choose different yeah spectrum of beliefs and it's but interesting you want to be part of a small little community of people who all think the same as you about mm. stuff like then you can feel special because you and your other flat earthers can have conferences and get together it's like and it's not it's not hard to get people to believe stuff that isn't true it's easy to get people to believe stuff yeah. that isn't true because when you put it out there they'd be like fuck i believe that and i believe that too you know with facebook yeah. with instagram with yeah. twitter yeah Shit's getting easier. Yeah, and, you know, as the technology gets better so that you'll be able to, you know, the voice stuff, um, you'll be able to hear, uh, you'll be able to, you know, see and hear people say things they never saw, they, they never said. Do you know what I mean? It's like that That will just get easier and easier and easier to do. So, you know, the, the far right in America will be able to get Barack Obama saying these terrible racist things because you'll be able to morph his face into blah, blah, blah. This yeah, voice, this voice, I hear that, yeah. I think Adobe have got stuff now where you mm. read a whole... Um, you read some set stuff into it, and then then um, this program so we will be using it for like voiceover stuff. Um, you just read a bunch of stuff in there, and then the computer basically just takes your voice and does voiceover stuff for you. But we don't want to use it as a final product, yeah, but for yeah. the edits and stuff. Like so, yeah. and that's just that's mm. just, if so. If you can use it for useful stuff, people use it for sinister yeah. stuff. Mm. That sort of plays into the whole idea of tribes. Mm-hmm. You know, being in a tribe. You know, saying you know this is us. If you're not part of this belief or this, you know, if you don't have interest in this, you're not, you know, with us. That's yeah. a fundamental key thing about human beings. Yeah. It's part of like, one. Of, I think one of the downsides of this wanting to be connected to other people is that one of the easiest ways to connect to other people is to unite against other people. So we do this stuff all the time, right? It's like they're, um, they're not us. They're, we have our own little tribe. Sports, we do it with sports teams. Like, oh, we hate them. Why? Because they... Yeah. for a different sports team um, and the whole bloods and crips yeah, and all yeah, these gangs yeah. and, and racism is all about that it's just about yeah. let's have our little let's have our little we're so fundamentally different mm. to these other people it's us versus them us versus them us versus them um, and you know weirdly race doesn't exist for geneticists it's not, we're not that genetically dissimilar that mm. race is a thing that a geneticist would even uh, talk about yeah what, what I really uh, loved about your stuff was after the Christchurch shootings you know because I'm a Muslim and, you know, I was sort of in that sort of community and I, you know, I saw your post, it was like pretty deep and, you know, could you give your perspective for the people that ha- didn't sort of hear it at the time or see it? Yeah, I think New Zealand got a little bit too good for itself. It's like we were all saying they are us and we're all together and yeah. we all felt attacked and it's like, no, we fucking weren't all attacked and no, we fucking weren't all together. Mm. If we'd been, if we'd been standing outside that mosque, he wouldn't have shot me, he would shot you and yeah. that's basically... That is how that one works. And so when all these people said, they are us and we're all sitting together, we're all no, we weren't all attacked. When that mosque was had swastikas written on it, when they were leaving pig heads outside the mosque, where were the flowers and the people then? Like, I think it's lovely that people now are saying these things. And, and I think people were genuine when they said, we're standing in support with the Muslim community and with people mm. that were affected and all that. And, and that's... I'm not taking away from that sentiment at all, but I think we let ourselves off the hook if we think we weren't racist as fuck to begin with. You know, mm. when Muslim women all around the country are talking about having their hijabs pulled off their head by people on the streets. So where were we then? If they are us, 
where were we then? Where were people saying stuff then? Um, yeah. And there are lots of, I mean, and it's not just the Muslim community. It's like there are people, there are Chinese people, Korean people, there are Indian people. Lots of non-white people will say New Zealand's racist as fuck. When Taika Waititi said a few years ago when he was New Zealand of the Year, New Zealand's racist as fuck, a whole bunch of people got up in arms. I mean, oh, you traitor, that's treason. And it's like, what? He's just saying something that's true. If 40-something percent of our prison population are Māori, but they're only 14% of our general population... There is no other explanation for that other than systemic racism. That's that's the only way you can explain those statistics. Mm. It's like, and that's not necessarily saying it's racist policemen or racist judges, but there's a whole bunch of systemically racist thing, which means that one portion of our community ends up being a much bigger proportion of the people in prison. So it kind of, I like the sentiment that people are saying they are us, we're all standing together, but let's not pretend, let's not, we're letting ourselves off the hook if we say, that that we were doing that to begin with. And yeah. you get all these celebrities who had to go back and, you know, media personalities who had to go back over their Facebook posts and their things to see if they had, they kind of whitewashed it to see if they put any Islamophobic stuff out there. And it's like, dude, if you even had to fucking think about going back to look at your posts, you were on his team. You may not have thought that you were on his team, but you fucking were. That's how yeah. it works. It's, I think, from like sort of our community perspective, it has been like a talking to other members of the community, they did feel like it was it was coming, like there was you know, not not an attack this big or but there was something. there was something there that yeah. you know and yeah. and I think one of the w- the first times I experienced it was when I was out with my family and we were at this sort of lake and we're just, you know, having a good time. It was a family picnic, all that stuff. And because I don't look the type like a Muslim type or a yeah. Middle East and I don't really look it, I was, you know, behind these two white gentlemen of not gentlemen, fuck. There were some bogans, but they were they were sitting down, and my family were in the corner, and you know they were just minding their own business. They were just laughing yep. all this, and these men were saying, you know, we should probably call the cops. They're up to something, something you know terroristy. This was after the Sydney uh, cafe attacks. Yeah, and I was I was like, fuck, what the hell, like. I was real shocked because they didn't even know who we it's were. It's a fucking picnic. We're like, yeah. really? What? And these guys were quite serious. Yeah. And I was there. I was like, fuck, man. Like, how can, how can, it's it's very hard for me to grasp that because, the, you know, I know them. They're my family. You know, they're my blood. Like, and that's my mum. My sister's yeah, you're talking about exactly. over there. Exactly. <laughs> you know, yeah, I, yeah. I couldn't comprehend it. Yeah. But the truth is, this is reality. This is Taika Waititi was right. New Zealand yeah. is racist as fuck. It is, mm. and and there's this there's this whole Islamophobic sentiment that's been going on for a long time, and it comes out of the movies that we see where the bad guys now aren't Russians, they're Muslims. Yeah, you know, and it's like they're they're the people that we should be afraid of, and so. And it and it's totally counter to the reality because in in the US where all this stuff comes from, white supremacists, white yeah. people have killed more people than Muslim people have. Oh, I think you're more at risk from fucking toddlers in America than you are from 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 yeah. fucking overseas terrorists. Mm. But there's this sentiment that's taken place in people's head, and it, and it's the same stuff that happens here. And so when people kind of climbed on that but it's like you don't have a right to say that we were all attacked like you mm. don't have the right to say that you only have the right to say that if every time a mosque in your area was defaced or people were uh, abused or threatened if every single time you stepped in and you said something and you were there and you did stuff then you do but if you didn't then you don't have the right to yeah, say that but even the opposite like what's you know, fucking ridiculous every time an attack overseas, you know, let's say a Muslim person, I don't even count them as Muslim, happens, people expect us to sort of be like, fuck, we don't support that shit. Like, we, we're like fucking, oh, no. you know, <laughs> encouraging them to do that shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't realise that like, it's people like, come up, you know, what do you think about that? Like, fuck, what do I know? Like, I don't believe in that shit. Like, well, it's, it's like really every, I know every they time some, you in a way. and they don't expect white people to do that when there's some sh- mass shooting where yeah. some crazed redneck shoots people. I'm not. People don't come to me. Hey, Nigel, what? Uh, you, do you support what that crazed redneck white guy yeah. did? No, I did. No, that's not my thing at all. Mm. But it's like, yeah, I know. I think more or less the older generation s- sort of has that sentiment when something overseas happens. They're like, fuck, like, why aren't Muslims standing up for this shit? Like, because like they... fuck it out. Like, like, I believe in that shit. Like, you know what I mean? It's, yeah. it's yeah. very hard. Yeah. And 
you know, when we go overseas, like especially when I'm traveling with my family, you always have that, oh, are we going to get stopped by customs or is there going to be some shit like that? Yeah. It's real weird. Like, yeah. So a couple of years ago, I, I visited Iran and now for the rest of my life, every time I go to America, um, I'll, uh, you, I'll, I'll, I'll have to get a visa. I can't get an Esther thing because I've been to Iran, Iran which is the axis of evil, yeah. apparently. Uh, and that's the that's the weirdness of the world that we live in. Mm. And it's it's like, and it's because people are so divorced from any sort of sense of history or understanding that they, and people just believe. Americans go, why does Iran hate us so much? I don't know. Maybe because they had a really functioning fucking democratic government and you people went and fucked it up. Like yeah. the CIA did that kind of stuff. Maybe yeah. they hate you because of that. Yeah. What is interesting, it's... I had a sort of a debate the other, the other night with a work colleague, and she's from South Africa, and she's uh, sort of a coloured South African. And she was saying how all white South Africans are fucking racist, they don't want us, all this shit. And then I asked her, but aren't you doing the same thing right now? Aren't you generalising in a... Because I know yeah. so many white... South Africans, they're lovely people. They don't believe in that shit. I know also coloured South Africans that they're very separatist. They don't like white. You know, where does that stop, though? It's like no one, there is no particular, no group on the planet has the market cornered from being good or bad. Like, fundamentally, we're all, we're all, humans and because of that we yeah. have a range of good humans and bad humans and that has nothing to do with your gender your ethnicity your sexual orientation any of those things any of those things can make you good or bad it's not you know mm. like it's not like anyone has the market corner on being good or bad well that's a simple concept simple but the amount of people that don't believe in that yeah, concept I know. I know. is ridiculous yeah we were driving by and this guy was saying that you know all indian people like this and i'm like have you met 1.2 billion Indian people There's to heaps make of that them. statement? <laughs> you know, like, you it know? would take you like 87 million yeah. lifetimes to meet all of them and Exa- get to know them. Exactly. Like, have you met them? Like, yeah. how can you say that shit? It's it's hard. For me, it was real hard because when you're saying like all white people or all Indians or all Chinese people, you're saying you're making a massive generalization. Yeah. 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 Well, it's like when people talk about all these immigrants are making means that we're losing what it means to be New Zealander. What the fuck does it mean to be a New Zealander? Like, are you saying that me living here in Auckland has the same idea of what it means to be a New Zealander as uh, as a farmer on a dairy farm in Invercargill, like mm-hmm. who goes out pig hunting at the weekends? It's like yeah. you're saying we both have the same thing. Someone who works on advertising in Queen Street has the same idea of what it means to be a New Zealander as someone living in I don't know Stewart Island who's a fisherman. It's like yeah. I even don't know what it means to be a New Zealander. It's just you just a, it's the place where you live and mm. you go to the loo and you eat stuff. A lot of xenophobia in that as well. A lot a lot of you know they're here to take what we have, what we hold <laughs> yeah. dear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. it's like mm, it's maybe. a very hard <laughs> thing. You know, yeah. it, it, it's. It's stemming from so many biases, and I think one of the main ones is the implicit bias we have, because we've been conditioned to think in a way, we automatically assume something. Yeah, it's just, yeah. I mean, I just think simple as best, and Taika Waititi was right when he said New Zealand's racist as fuck. We yeah. just are. We don't like to think that we are, but we are. And if nothing else, hopefully what, what will happen now is that more people will stop and question that. And so the core of people who would say something if they did see some racist shit unfolding, I think has increased and whether it stays increased is that's that's another thing i mean i mm-hmm. heard someone the other day is talking about oh all this you know all this fundraising for the christchurch stuff it's gone on a bit a bit long feels like it feels like they're overdoing it a bit it's like if 50 fucking white people yeah. have been shot in christchurch or timaru or wherever we'd be going on about it for years and fucking years oh, it's 100%. like i think if the 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 title was switched, and they yeah, said, Muslim, yeah, let's yeah. say a proclaimed Muslim person. I think would be in a very different place, like yeah, as a country. Yeah, you know, it'd be us trying to say, you know, we don't, we don't stand for that. Like, you know, we're normal, ki-. you know. Yeah, it's in a way. I think uh, it's it's strengthened the community as well. I think there's a lot of support as well. Like, I think after, I think we can take a lot of stuff from it, learn a lot of stuff. It, mm. It's. I think if we reflect on it, it's something we would look at. But like you know, we we did, we s- sort of moved and we realized our weakness or problems in the society we're living in. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I hope that some good will come out of it in the sense that um, 
that, that we'll be more conscious of racism and that that stuff will be less acceptable and that more people will speak up against it. But time will tell. Time yeah. will tell if we... I think, you know, the idea that kind of they are us and that we're all this one... Per, I think it's a, it's a really nice sentiment. Time will tell if we, how much we actually mean that. Mm. That's, no, it's very interesting as well. I um, sort of want to segue into the whole... Uh, one of the major problems I've seen in, like, high school especially is mental illness. It's, mm-hmm. it's a fucking massive, massive problem. I can't emphasise the amount of it because I've met so many people that... You know, they, they, they live in affluent society, affluent uh, suburbs, but they're still depressed. They're still not enjoying life. And it's it's quite saddening in a way. Uh, like, what is depression? What is anxiety? Like, you know, what is that? It's, a, it's very hard for someone that personally, I, I wouldn't say I go through that. And it's hard for me to put myself sometimes in that situation and empathize with it. So things like depression, so depression is different to just feeling down because everybody feels down from time mm. to time. So depression is kind of when um, you feel down all the time and uh, everything is bleak and um, the world seems to be colourless and nothing makes you feel good and it's hard to sleep and it's hard to eat um, and all of those sorts of things. Um, and, you know, often what goes along with that is anxiety as well. So the sense of just feeling anxious about stuff all the time. So that could be social anxiety or worry about exams or worry about your life or, you know, um, feeling anxious around other people. Um, and there's a bit of a debate about whether or not that stuff is increasing or whether or not that actually we're just Diagnosis, talking about yeah. it more. Mm. Um, and I don't think there's really any way of knowing whether or not things are increasing or not. What, what we do know is that lots of people suffer from the stuff like it's a problem for a lot of people. Mm. But but do you think it's been exacerbated by the current technology? Where I think it's very tr- it's a very fashionable thing yeah. for people to talk about that. There was I saw a thing on telly a little while ago. Some guy's just written some book. A lawyer of all people has just written a book talking about how screens are poisoning your kids and making them crazy and mm. and what you can do to stop it. It's like, well, dude, that's not what. That's yeah. that's not what the science what the science it's says. It's an easy thing to say. Yeah, let's yeah. blame computer games and mm. let's blame screens. What the science says is that there's no clear indication that screen time in and of itself is causing people harm. And so mm. people want to believe that it is. Um, yeah. And people want to believe that, you know, violent video games and all this kind of stuff. But we've always blamed popular culture. Like we used to blame Elvis Presley for, <laughs> you know, and long hair for problems. And now <laughs> we blame computer games. Yeah. Um the reality but don't is you think it's uh, it's true that the the correlation it's not causation correlation between the number of people uh, spending on fa- the time they're spending on Facebook and the rates of depression and anxiety they're both sort of in the same trend. But the, do you think the, that's that's a sort of fake? No, I think thing that, that, that that's danger around correlation. Just because two things have the same pattern doesn't mean that that one thing causes the other. Do you know mm. what I mean? So yeah, it could yeah, be yeah. that Facebook makes you depressed and it kind of makes sense because I find Facebook a little bit depressing. Um, yeah. But it could just be that, you know, if you're more depressed, then you're more likely to do those things. So it's I think it's it's there's no causal relationship between screen time and and problems with mental illness and, and and in a sense kind of that stuff is like it's a rabbit hole about well let's try and figure out why things are bad the kind of the reverse of that is that more kind of positive psychology approach well what what is it that makes people better and so there's some really good evidence that things like mindfulness and meditation like if you're anxious or depressed yeah mindfulness and meditation will help get the headspace app do 10 minutes a day within two or three weeks you're going to start to feel a little bit better like it's yeah mindfulness is about teaching your brain to deal with some of that self-destructive negative stuff um and that's the thing that we don't really get in you're not really taught to do that stuff anywhere um so if you the cinema is changing now as well like a lot more people are into getting into that yeah and i think more schools are too which is good like i think we should be teaching mindfulness in all schools to all kids um Mm. but I think if you have this belief that you should just believe everything your brain tells you, then you're gonna. That's really dangerous. Like your brain mm. doesn't always tell you the truth about stuff. Sometimes it sees things which aren't true and which are unkind, um, and just make you feel bad. Yeah, I think it was Aristotle that said, uh, "A great mind is that one that can uh, entertain a thought without accepting it." Yeah. And it's like shit. Like that's powerful. Yeah, like, it's like yeah, Buddhist. Like it's a whole. Like for thousands of years, humans, various humans have kind of said. 
no, we should just not get wound up about shit. You know, yeah. the fundamentally that's what mindfulness says. Mm. It's like you can have the thought, but you don't have to engage with it. Mm. I think I've been guilty in making that claim as well that, you know, social media is sometimes enhancing the whole idea of being unhappy or, you know, having issues. I think for me, reflecting on those that idea, I found that it's not that social media in itself is bad. It's such a fucking great tool. You know, we promote our stuff on here it's yeah. a really good way yeah, to it's a great tool. see what your friends are doing but i think it's the idea of spending so long on it you change your in a way when i spend too long on instagram i sort of feel like fuck like why do i give a shit like you know everyone's posting pictures of happiness or the and your idea of what life is supposed to be like it's blurred yeah everyone everyone like people will put you know here's a picture of me eating you know lobster with peacock feathers <laughs> in it no one posts a picture of, oh, I went to get lunch and the, there was nothing Fucking and there was just some mouldy bread. So yeah. I thought I'll cut the crust off it and I'll just cut all the mould off and I'll whack some cheese on that. And so here's mm. a picture of my slightly mouldy cheese sandwich that I had for lunch. Like no one puts that up, but that's yeah. actually the reality of life is that sometimes you cut the, bre- the edge of the bread off because it's mouldy and you're too lazy to go out and get some more. But the thing is, if that's all you see, if the, the good times, the good life if that's all you see you blow yourself into thinking that that's all yeah everyone else's life is amazing no they're just as fucked up as you they're just putting the good bits on a filter and they're putting it on but it's FOMO the fear of missing out yeah yeah and that's where I think that's where I think skills like mindfulness and being more deliberate about how you consume content on the internet is a good thing because if you just mindlessly consume it and you think yeah man those people are having such an amazing life the the beach with all their friends and their expensive stuff and they're no, that's not how it is. I think, yeah. you know, it's you. so you have to be able to step back from that and go, actually, all humans' lives are imperfect and mm. um, they're just putting the good bits up there. They're not putting the bits up there where they had woke up and felt shitty. They're not putting the bits up there where they feel unhappy or discontented with their life or any of those sorts of things. Mm. But they will. Because and you can't really, it's, I haven't seen anyone for a long time put that shit up, like they're depressed or... You know, I'm happy or I'm crying. Like, you know, it's, it's a... <laughs> I'll never do it because yeah. I'm super lazy. But I, 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 every so often I think, oh, God, just for a year, I should just basically Instagram all the boring shit of my life. <laughs> like, just the boring <laughs> shit. Like, oh, yep, 304 unread emails. Instagram that. Fuck. You know, fucking Sunday morning, picking up dog shit from the lawn. Instagram that. Yeah. Uh, went to get uh, milk. Oh, ran a milk. Instagram the Insta- Like, just the shitty, boring, shitty, mm. normal shit of life. I, I'm, I'm just too lazy to do it. But. Yeah. that's. I think it's like being self-aware. That's the key thing. That self-awareness that, you know, maybe I'm spending too long on this. Maybe I should change. Maybe this is not what life seems to be. That's That's powerful. And I think what you said mindfulness it's fucking powerful for me like every morning i sort of try and meditate like in you know, 10 minutes a day every day and it's you realize still, a difference yeah and the good thing I, i'm mm. i'm an evidence-based guy so that the, mm. it's like i want to know if, if you're going to suggest doing something what's the evidence that it works and the truth is there's 50 years of research that shows that that mindfulness and meditation help and it's not just like it can help with things like anxiety and depression and negative thinking and all that kind of stuff but it also helps with sleep um, and it helps your immune system and it helps you to focus more and concentrate so it's not just something for bad stuff it's a, it's a way to help you deal with good stuff and to increase the amount of good stuff in your life as well mm. that's powerful like that's it's like a fucking drug we don't need to pay anyone where it's free essentially yeah. well there's a reason humans been doing it for thousands of years it's because yeah. it works mm. that, that, that's that is yeah I, I definitely can attest to it that it does work and it, it's real powerful uh, sort of stemming from away from that I watched your TED talk fucking good man it's, it's real, real dope and you talked about the purpose of life and what makes a happy happy life what's your take on that what is a happy life how can someone you know view the ideas and beliefs and learn for some something from it i think it's so the, i think the neuroscience which is, is pretty clear like just be nice to other people like the things in my life that i'm the most proud about or that uh, that make me feel the best aren't the vacuous empty stupid things like being on telly and stuff like that it's uh it's the stuff you do that's helpful to other people so you know it's when you're doing when i was working clinically with people and you help people to deal with 
the shit going on in their life or you help some kid who's in care to get back home again or it's the the fact that when we make a doco someone has sent you an email saying oh that that thing on um, that thing on the doco you made about money helped me and my wife sit down and really think about our finances and blah blah blah, blah. Yeah. um so it's the, like if you want to you know kind of i think have a better life just try and be kind and help other people no one can do it all the time like i'm not kind all the time i don't help people <laughs> all the time yeah sometimes i just want to slump on the couch and watch telly and not fucking help anyone i was yeah. like just fucking leave me alone i just want to watch you know yeah, yeah. this on tv now but when it's like you pick and choose your moments and so you do stuff that's helpful to other people it's it's kind of it's the thread that was i guess underneath all the telly we made it's like you just try and do stuff that's helpful to people because if you do, they get oxytocin, you get oxytocin, the world's a better place, everybody wins. Yeah, that's that's powerful. Like yeah. When you're genuinely, you know, helping someone without a return in, in any way, yeah. you, you've, you're like, fuck, man, I'm a good person. Just feels person. good. No one ever is going to, you, you, you very rarely ever think, oh, fuck, I wish I hadn't been so kind to that person just now. Like, mostly what happens, you go, oh, I actually feel quite good now because I did something nice for that other person right now. You know? Yeah. It's like, and if you think about it, the, the response of, of people to the attack in Christchurch, the shooting at the mosque, was to kindness. People wanted to be kind. Like people felt bad and they mm. wanted to be kind and help people. And and that's that's what humans do. Like we yeah. are kind. We help people. It's natural. It's it's an, it's a natural state. Yeah, that's one of the things that. Uh, have you read the book Tribes by Sebastian Junger? Heard of it. Haven't he talks about that. He says that when catastrophic events like this happen, people bound together. In the idea of helping each other, yeah, because they want to band together. They realize yeah. something. We're in danger. We need to do our best to serve others, and that's cool. Yeah, we're drawn to. It's like that. You know, you look at this. What's the stuff on the internet? Stuff that goes viral. It's when you see nice things. Do you know what I mean? It's like mm. someone makes some some usually some av- clever advertising company will make some nice little thing where it's someone being nice to someone but in it a nice make way. Doesn't sense as well. Like, no, no, it's a shampoo ad, but. Like there's a mother it's really and nice. son, you know, and, and you're, it's, oh, you're the, the little puppy help yeah. the kitten get out of the water barrel. Yeah. You're going, oh, that's really nice. Yeah, it's like that's what we do. We're drawn. Nice is good. Nice, we're drawn to it. So if you want to be happy, just try and be nicer to people. Yeah, man, that's a that's a real cool philosophical idea to just live by. It's simple, but it's not easy as well. Like it's sometimes hard. It takes takes. A yeah, bit. and don't beat yourself up when you're not. It's like I always think you just you you just have to be. You start off by being kind to yourself, and being kind to yourself means you forgive yourself for the shitty bad things that you, from time to time, will do. You can't just, you know, go around being an asshole and go, ah, it's all right, you're Mm. not such a bad bit. That's not right. But we're all a bit useless, and and we're all a bit unkind at times, and so you kind of have to be kind to yourself first and forgive yourself for the shitty things that you sometimes might Mm. think or do, and just try and be better. You know? That's powerful. That's all. What what advice would you get? What life advice would you give your eighteen year old self? Um, Thinking back. Oh God, my eighteen year old self. I think what I'd say is is it's just you don't don't fret so much about trying to be something that you're not. It's just you, mate. Like it's just it will always just be this. So just be relaxed about that. And because I think when I was younger. Like most people, you're trying to be liked and you're trying to figure out who you are and how to be. And it's like, no, fucking just relax, dude. It's just, this is it. You're this. You're just fucked up. This. this is it. This is your yeah, problem. Yeah, it's like yeah. people will like you. People won't like you. It's fine. You can't make people like you. Just be who the hell you are. And if they like you, good. And if they don't, fuck them. <laughs> That's powerful. Um, what's your favorite book or the, the book you've given out the most? Or recommended mm. the most. Our favorite book is actually a fiction book called The Road by Cormac McCarthy. Okay. Which is this amazing book about a father and son traveling through post apocalyptic America. Uh, and it's oh, just the movie as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah I've seen the movie. Movie's terrible. The, books, the book is the most beautifully written book ever. It's the only book I've ever read and then I reread it again. And it's just beautiful. Yeah. Um, that's probably my favorite book. Mm. What about any non fiction? Um, ooh, non-fiction. Uh, I, uh, ooh, I mean, there's lots of really good non-fiction books. Um, weirdly, uh, uh, Edward de Bono's books, uh, his I- books are terrible, they're boring, but um, his ideas are fantastic. Yep. Uh, that book, Sapiens, is a really good oh, book about mate. humans and all that kind Fucking of stuff. Good. Mm, quite like yeah. that. 
Uh, and there's another book called Fast and Slow Thinking by a guy called um, Daniel Kahneman. Daniel yeah. Kahneman. Also a very good book if you're a human trying to make decisions. So there's just, I think there's a problem is there's just so many good books. Yeah. And you can just learn so much from it. You can. And then, yeah. you know, then there's good tally to watch, like there's Sopranos and there's Breaking Bad and there's oh, fuck yeah. Game of Thrones. <laughs> oh. So much to do. I know. So much to do. I know. What, what's the, the impact you want to leave behind? I don't really care because I'll be dead. Like, <laughs> I just, I don't know. That'll be yeah. someone. I, well, no, I don't think about that because I yeah. just think, oh, fuck, I'll be dead. It's like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's like maybe the last thing I'll do on the way out is trip and break the world and go, oh, well, sorry about that. That's it. That's um, that. No, I really don't think about that. I just think uh, it's like, I, I just, I do try, I do think a lot about the fact that you only get to be alive once. And um, so I missed most of the first bit of the universe and I'll miss almost all of the rest of it. I'm going to get this little bit of, yeah. kind of about now. Um, and so I want to try and do things during that time that um, that I enjoy and that I think are reasonable things to do. And so I, I think it's good to think about the fact that, you know, all of us get to be alive for a really small amount of time. So if I can make yeah. the most of it. Not a lot. Don't put up with too much shit and don't settle for things and don't let someone else make decisions about how your life is going to be. And if someone says that you can't do something, fuck them. Like, just find a way to do it. Like, yeah. and, and you can, things will go wrong a lot and that's fine. Like, uh, most things that you try and do fail. They just do. But And occasionally things work. So it's, it's like, don't, yeah, when someone says, oh, no. That's fine. Just find a way around them. Find a way to solve. There's, there's always a solution. There's always a way kind of forward. Uh, that's powerful. What's any last thoughts you want to leave with the audience? No, I still think that Arya Stark is going to kill <laughs> the Night King. I don't know. That's a hard one. She's going to get a face. She's going to put a dead a walker's face on. Because there was one of the things in the promos that she said something like. Uh, like death has many faces. I'm I'm looking forward to seeing this one or something. I think, oh, yeah, yeah, she's yeah. going to peel her face off. She's going to stick that on. She's going to stab him with a Valyrian mm. dagger. And I don't know. I think that little kid. That guy's got, that guy holds the power. Oh, Brandon, you think yeah, so? He's, you think he's the Night King? I think he's the Night King himself. Mm. Well, I've heard it here. Where, where can people find you? Actually, they Let's, can't. That's the oh. mystery of it. Do you have any social media? Any? Oh, like I do, I've got a Facebook thing. Yeah, uh, an Instagram thing. Um. Uh, yeah, but like this lot won't be interested in my Facebook stuff. It's mostly stuff the parents would read. Uh, <laughs> my Instagram stuff, I try and put interesting photos up there. But yeah, um, uh, yeah that's yeah. I'm, I'm like a I'm like a ghost. Fucking hell. Yeah, I love it. Minimalist. I really appreciate your time, man. That's that was that was incredible. I learned a lot from it. Really appreciate it. You're Thank welcome. Thank you, Nigel. Cheers. You're very welcome.